Prossimo speaker, podemos, uh, allora, Maurizio, Flavio, David Giuseppe Anzalone, sta già chi conosco? Uh, David Giuseppe Anzalone, are you with us? I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Sorry about that. I'm trying to turn on my camera, but actually I just came back from a, from a trip, so uh, I just was setting up my techniques while the other talks were going on. I just now try to turn on my camera. Anyways, already good evening from Switzerland. Um, as you might see, there's no natural light here. And so, uh, but I think, what, what time is it at your place? In it Brazil? is two, um, half past two p.m. Okay, okay. I mean, it's Switzerland now. I guess it's like Italy, no? Like uh, four yes, or five exactly. hours. Exactly. I am in the south of Switzerland, in Ticino. Ah. Uh -huh. And uh, yes, so hopefully my PowerPoint finally starts. Let's see what happens. Canton Ticino. Exactly, yes. So are you seeing now? Yes. You see the PowerPoint? Yeah, we can see your screen. So if you... Yeah, put in yes, the, I'm doing. Uh, yeah, great. Okay. Okay, we're so, there. Thank you so much. Sorry well for done. the wait. I think you can start. Okay, perfect. So, um, as I said, the title of my change of my paper is a little has changed a little, and it's one hell of a problem for omnisubjectivity. So. Now, let's start to define this title. What is omnisubjectivity? Omnisubjectivity is a view defended by Linda Zagzebski in her uh, 2016 book, uh, Omnisubjectivity, a Defense of a Divine Attribute, or in, uh, in earlier papers. I will just focus on the book now. So how does she define omnisubjectivity? She defines it as perfect total empathy. So we all now have a grasp of what empathy is, but let's define it. Empathy is for an agent X, so for David, for Nicola, for Diego. To have empathy for Y, for another um, agent, is for X, for Diego, for example, to acquire a perspective like that of Y, for example, David. So what happens in the empathetic experience? X represents or copies Y's conscious state, as if it were her own. And the as if clause is, um, is very important, as X must know that the state she's trying to copy is not her own. So now, for example, if I, I am empathizing with you, unfortunately you don't see your faces, that are bored by this talk, then I reproduce that boredness, knowing, okay, that I'm not the bored one, but the boring one. So I'll try to do a little better. Now, let's take a step further. What is perfect total empathy? Perfect total empathy is defined as follows. So to have perfect total empathy for an agent is to empathize with why in a perfect way, that is by acquiring perfectly accurate copies of Y's conscious states. So the most close to Y's first perspective um, possible, while being aware that they're not her own, okay, for the agent um, X. And then to empathize all of Y's conscious states throughout Y's entire life. And this, according to Zaksepsky, is the kind of empathy that God has with every conscious creature that ever lived or will live. Now, why should God have these features? Okay, so it's not going forward. Okay. So, why should God... Maybe you see that at least now. You see the email that I'm scrolling? Yes. Perfect. Okay. 
So according to Zagzebski, there are facts of the matter about what it is like for a subject to have a conscious experience of a certain kind. Okay? So when Mary, taking uh, Jackson's famous example, when Mary finally discovers for the first time what it is like to be red, to see reds, what, ha what happens to Mary? Mary knew all the propositions concerning what it is like to see red, all the propositions concerning, uh, yes, all the proposition concerning what it is like to, um, to experience colors, but finally she experienced colors. So for example, in our pandemic, I'm sure that many of us while going out in the sun for the first time after a few days says, oh, now I know what it is like to see the sun again. It's the same thing. There are these conscious experience, these facts of the matter about what it is like that are not reducible to knowing propositional content. content. They are only known to having these conscious experience. Finally, I know what it is like to have a PowerPoint that is not working at a philosophical presentation. Now, for God to be omniscient, that is the idea, he must know these facts and have these conscious experiences. And he can through the attribute of omni-subjectivity. So, on the, unfortunately for some, the omni-subjectivity raises a few issues. And we could say that it raises issues concerning the end of time. So why? I'll just keep the suspense for a, for a minute. So let's go back to Zagzebski. Zagzebski thinks that omnisubjectivity is compatible with timelessness and immutability. However, Ryan Mullins thinks it is not. Um, thinks that while it is not contradictory to believe that God is timeless and God is immutable, an omnisubjective God would suffer eternally if God is timeless. So if God is being bored by this talk and God is timeless and immutable, that is to say he has no change, no beginning, no succession, and no end, God will suffer with no change, no beginning, no succession, and no end. It will be a big problem for God because we would have a perfect being that suffers eternally. And then, so the question is, can a perfect being suffer eternally? I'm not sure about that. And then we would have a problem, uh, so to speak, an eschatological problem as pointed out by Blankenhorn. If heaven, says Blankenhorn, is the participation in God's life, as it is classically explained or classically uh, thought of, then if God continues to suffer eternally, we, uh, supposing we are all blessed, we will all participate in God's suffering for eternity. And so heaven is no more a place of joy, but is a place of eternal conscious torment. Okay, it's like hell. Now, the, 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 the idea of Mullins is to think God not as timeless, but everlasting and changeable. Therefore, he says, at the end of time, he will finally experience blessedness after having suffered as an omnisubjective God. So before creation, God is blessed. He decides to create humanity, knowing that we will screw it up. We will screw up. And finally, he will for some time suffer and at the end of time um as the creatures will experience blessedness finally also god will experience blessedness so the, the solution of malins is to so to speak to uh to make the end beautiful okay but however it seems to me that there are other problems again with traditional Christianity. And the problem I'm presenting now is one hell of a problem because it's the challenge coming from hell. So the objection from hell goes as follows. 
first of all, let's try to describe hell in its traditional description or in its traditional view. Traditionally, hell is considered broadly uh, um, everlasting. That is to say, it has a beginning of perhaps the, the death of the individual or the final judgment, but no end. So it's not possible for the damned sinner to escape from it. It is retributive. That is to say, it involves punishment in some form. It involves suffering of some form. And then it is conscious. The individual is aware of a suffering as a result of her separation from God and the suffering she's experiencing. I'll just ask you if you still hear me because I don't see you. Yes. Perfect. Si, si. Benissimo. So <laughs> that's the traditional way in which hell is seen, or at least the way I understand it. Now, what's the argument? If one assumes that omnisubjectivity is true, that is to say that God empathetically suffers with all conscious creatures who suffer and assumes hell in its traditional form, so this form of hell I just showed you, the argument goes as follows. God suffers empathetically with all conscious creatures who suffer. Okay, that's the assumption. We have hell in its traditional form as a second assumption. The argument is, if God empathetically suffers with all creatures who suffer, then God empathetically suffers with the damned in hell. But God does empathetically suffers with all creatures who suffer. Therefore, God empathetically suffers with the damned in hell. If the damned in hell, okay, suffer everlastingly, then God empathetically suffers with the damned in hell everlastingly the damned in hell suffer everlastingly therefore god empathetically suffers with the damned everlastingly two is justified by one and the first assumption three is obtained by modus ponens from one and two six is obtained by modus ponens from four and five and five is justified by hell in its traditional form so we are now back to the problems that mullins and blankenhorn talked about we are back in hell as I said before, as I described the heaven that was described before. We have a God who suffers everlastingly and probably the blessed who want, as they participate in God's life, will suffer everlastingly. So there is no final redemption. There is no final redemption from suffering, at least. So uh, I'm not, not giving another view of, of redemption as salvation in this case. It's just, okay we don't want to suffer when we are in hell in heaven sorry and we don't want god to suffer at the end of times so if this is the case and we want to keep on the subjectivity i propose three strategies that i will try to refute so okay. the first strategy is to deny it deny that, su that the suffering involved in God's empathetic experience is the dominant emotion. The second, in a similar spirit, I will explain all of this, distinguishes between the empathetic experience and the empathetic response. The third, finally introduces some moral constraints on empathy. So, now, if we're all on board, let's start with strategy number one. So, what does it mean that God is not dominated by his emotion? Him, his emotions or his negative emotions, actually. That's, that is the first strategy. It's better to say like that. So it can mean, first of all, that God's emotional life is rational. That God's emotional life is rational. That is to say that he does not act, act irrationally over grief and sorrow. So, my brother falls in the garden. And as he falls in the garden, um, I get very, very, very panicked. But he just has a little scratch. So, and I start to panicking and say, oh, what's happening? Oh, this is crazy. This is, this is, this is, this is really, really bad. But this is not rational 
And if God is perfectly rational, God will not irrationally um, act over grief and sorrow in this sense. So God doesn't make a drama out of my little brother falling on, uh, on the, uh, in the garden and having a little, little scratch. Okay? But now, does that really solve our challenge? So the question is the following. Does God's not acting irrationally over suffering actually deny or diminishes or takes away better the fact that God is not suffering? No. It just says that he, his reaction or his actions that follow suffering are not irrational in the sense that God is not making too, too big of a drama. But what about the damned suffering in hell? Wouldn't God, a perfectly loving God, make much bigger of a drama when it comes to eternal conscious suffering, never ending, of his beloved creatures, of his beloved human beings? Now, the second version of this strategy is that his blessedness exceeds his negative emotions. So now we have the idea that the positive emotion is much more, it's much bigger, so to speak, than his negative emotions. So Hartstorn says that God primarily enjoys the vision of his own necessary essence, which is perfect, so he enjoys himself, and only secondarily, so to speak, feels the pain of other persons than himself. So that is a, actually a quite interesting view, according to me, because we're saying that just as we have problems in our life, in our daily life, we say, okay, I'm not thinking about this now some, somehow. Um, I am just happy with what I have. I am content with what I have. Maybe I have some problems with my job, but I have a good family. And this feeling, this emotion is quite, uh, trumps, that's the word, trumps the other emotions, the negative emotions concerning my problems in my job. Now, Obviously, the question is, is there a fact of the matter? Is there a clear-cut um, fact of the matter when it concerns the dominance of an emotion on another? And if we do want to um, impose or if we do want to define a clear fact of the matter, it might be that we have to uh, take emotional phenomena to be quantifiable. That is Creel's objection in his 1986 uh, monograph on divine impassibility. So we ask, as Creel does, whether God's enjoyment of himself contributes to 1%, to 2%, to 99%, to 99.99%, yes or no? And how much suffering would we still allow God to undergo if we really take heart in this challenge. Second strategy, it's the empathetic response, the, 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 the challenge of distinguishing, the, the strategy of distinguishing the empathetic experience with the empathetic response. So I could, for example, share the suffering of an innocent victim, um, empathetic experience, so the experience that the subject has and then there is a contribution of the subject and response to this shared suffering with a feeling of anger, for example. Okay, so it's very similar to the first interpretation of the first strategy. Now, again, a question is, what happened with the suffering of the damned? So, God, what, what happens to God? God um, Responds to the to the suffering of the damned, for example, with a sense of justice. He knows that he's doing the right thing, or that hell is the right punishment. Okay, he knows that they deserve to be there. He knows that it's right, that it's just, that it's holy, to, that they are there while the blessed are not there. But first of all, I go back to the first issue. According to me, the suffering is still shared. It doesn't take away if we have full-fledged omnisubjectivity this 
is just a response to that. It doesn't take away the fact that he's suffering. But even if we disqualify or we relativize better this suffering to the reaction of God, we could ask ourselves, what kind of empathetic response would fit a perfectly loving God? Would it be a sense of justice? Eh, perhaps. But would that be then a negative response or a positive response? Are there empathetic responses that do not involve anything negative? Okay, that's the point of departure. When it comes to responding to the shared suffering of the damned, yes or no? Finally, the third constraint are the third strategy are introducing moral constraints. So we all know the what sometimes is called the H objection of, of, of creels. Can God feel horny, hateful, cruel, sinful? Is God morally speaking able to share the suffering of the damned? So that's the question. So some people, as Creo, think that there are some uh, emotions that are inappropriate and immoral, or some feelings that are inappropriate and immoral. And so the question is, can God feel like a sinner? Can God feel horny, hateful, cruel, sinful, sadistic? If we accept that these are immoral and that a perfect being cannot share these immoral feelings or these immoral states, then God shouldn't um, shouldn't have shared these feelings, shared these emotions. We could say that there's something immoral in the suffering of the damned. But is there really, is it really so? Imagine again a scenario. Imagine a perfectly loving father, a perfectly just, omniscient father who punishes appropriately his child according to his behavior. So is the suffering that follows from that child being punished, is that immoral, yes or no? I'm not sure it is immoral, actually. I'm not sure the feeling of suffering, at least, at least all of it, is immoral. The suffering that follows um, for the son being punished. There's suffering that follows limitations, for example, of the capacity of moving if he is punished to stay in a room, for example. Now, in the same way, it does not seem to me that would be com at least completely immoral for God to take a share in the suffering of the damned. So we have finally seen the three strategies. And so my question is, where do we go from here? I just give a really <laughs> suggestion, actually a, a suggestion of a few paths that could be followed. The first is to rush back to impassibility, to the view that God and not suffer, cannot undergo negative emotions. So that's the way I define impassibility. So God cannot undergo negative emotions. He can go, for example, only through joy, enjoying himself, being happy about himself. As the, as the, the prime mover of Aristotle is happy as he, as he um, knows himself as he knows himself uh, in Metaphysics 12. It's the, the most happy experience a man could ever, uh, ever have, according to Aristotle. He says, we do it sometimes, but he's always happy about knowing himself as the perfect object of knowledge. Or we could abandon the traditional doctrine of hell, that's the way I'm going for it too, in favor of one of the competing views. It's specifically, I'm thinking about universal salvation or universal salvation, I repeat, or annihilationism. So the view that hell will be annihilated or that hell will be destroyed. And the, in that sense, 
at least a dent would also be destroyed and there would not be any um, any suffering subject still existing with which God should empathize with. In that case, and we finally go to the conclusion, heaven would be like Eric Clapton described it. Beyond the door, there's peace, I'm sure, and I know there'll be no more. Tears in heaven. Eric Clapton. Thank you for atten your attention, and don't hesitate to contact me for uh, any anything. I'm just happy to hear your feedback. Just wanted to say that I am. Um, I don't work on this regularly because I am more of a medieval philosopher, but I was happy to be able to share my ideas with you. Thank you. Thanks, David. I don't know, I can... Uh, uh, by the way, just my out of curiosity, uh, sei uno svizzero italiano, sei del canto ticino. Cresciuto qua, ma papà siciliano e mamma olandese, quindi un ah. po'. <laughs> ok, adesso sono di Bari, italiano, okay. italiano. Perfetto, Piacere. perfetto. So. Piacere mio. Grazie okay. di tutto. Oh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for your talk. And I don't know, there are, are there any questions? They have a question, actually. And uh, I was yeah. wondering whether you could help me out. Uh, I was thinking uh, one of the arguments uh, yes. against the... Uh, God's omniscience is, uh, it reminded me what you were saying uh, here, that the fact that, that the concept of omniscience, the omniscienza divina, is, yes. uh, uh, it makes no sense because at the end of the day, God cannot feel, uh, cannot know that there was sadness or lust or rage yes. or pain. Yes. Or, mm -hmm. And I was wondering uh, yeah. what are the implication of your, what uh, you told us today with regard to this problem, with uh, yes. omniscience and it's, uh, say, we should abandon omniscience, so the concept of omniscience is, uh, yes. I don't know. Oh. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so the, the I, th I think there is a, a, like a main argument against omniscience is that somehow there are facts to be known, so facts that are to be known in a perfectly omniscient uh, subject must know them, that are at least that are available, so to speak, in a limited perspective. So David Anzalone knows that now it's the time for the talk, now he is anxious and so on. So uh, if you remember the, the famous argument which started a bit all of this is, for example, Kretzmann argument against the um, it was against uh, the idea of God because he was atheist at the time, but he thought that a perfectly omniscient subject must know what time is it now, what time it is now. So, and, um, and, uh, and so that, but that is something that an omniscient God, a perfect God, if he is timeless, immutable, so other issues concerning perception cannot do because otherwise he would be a limited agent. Now, so you have this with emotions, you have this with, uh, with time, you have this with um, being sinful, for example, all of these, uh, these problematic experiences. So my view, um, I agree, I think, with Zagzebski that a perfect, so first he starts with omniscience, but if you read the book, then she continues with love, with uh, omnipresence also, which maybe is a bit, uh, is a bit fuzzy there, but... I think that I agree with her when she says that a perfectly loving God must know what is this really like to be us. So that is another, however, justification for omniscience in that, in, uh, in, or omnisubjectivity as bringing to omniscient or as entailed by omniscience, but primarily because of love. So I'm more, I'm going more to that direction if that's the question. Thank you. Thanks a lot, David. Uh, okay, there is another question by, uh, from Ed Ney Gonçalves Braga. Ed? Do you hear? Uh, All right. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I never thought about this problem before. It's very interesting. 
uh, I was wondering about. Uh, I think you 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 are discussing a, a a problem that happens mainly in the Abrahamic religions. So I was yes. wondering. So I was wondering why why the idea of the incarnation didn't pop out in any point of the discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, you you, you mm -hmm. are you. you are you are in Switzerland and you talked about universalism. So I, I thought about Karl Barth's idea of uh, of Jesus Christ being the, the the condemned one that God pours out yeah. all yeah. His, his moral problems in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ he resolves everything and we can hope <laughs> that in the end uh, all people will be saved but I we can we can't be sure about that so I was wondering what do you think about yeah. this idea okay okay so um, so I, I have two versions or three versions of this 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 paper I started a few years ago, actually, and then I didn't continue a lot on this uh, because I have other projects. But I started with the idea that with the consequences concerning heaven and hell. So I I wasn't so much interest, interested in what we could work on with respect to God's omnisubjectivity, the limits and so on of which I talked about, but more about heaven and hell. So I, I am... Uh, honestly speaking, not a universalist, but I, I think that um, if that's the question, what is, uh, what do I think of, of universalism or what do I think about um, Jesus being the ultimate atonement for everything? Um, I think that this is surely a possibility to go. So, um, and there are actually two issues concerning the incarnation. So the first one is this one. So now imagine the challenge works, my challenge works, okay? So if my challenge is working, then one could say, okay, let's imagine that Jesus took the whole blame of the universe. Jesus is the savior of the world, as in John 4. And if Jesus is the savior of the world, then... Um, he saves everyone, so there's no hell. So my challenge doesn't apply in the true world, so to speak, in the in, in the reality of things. It will, will never apply. We'll never have a problem about that um, at the end of time, obviously, because now we're all there is suffering in the world, so God is suffering if He is omnisubjective. But at the end of time, there will be complete redemption, and finally, God will not suffer, and no one will suffer. Okay, that's. That's a possibility. So that's a model of heaven and hell that is changing with respect to the tradition, at least. Okay. But the second issue concerning the incarnation, um, thank you for pointing it out, concerns the view that, um, that traditionally God doesn't suffer in his divine nature, but God suffers in Jesus. Okay. So that is something where Blankenhorn is going, I think, in this paper. If we have this traditional view, we say that through Jesus, God could be omnisubjective in his human nature. And God has, uh, Jesus has his human nature um, forever and ever, okay? So now, this is somewhere I am going in my paper. Um, if you want to discuss it, we can discuss it, but I'm afraid of what I will say. But anyways, there is a possibility that maybe if God suffers through Jesus, okay, in his human nature, not his in divine nature, I agree with that. That is the classical view. But he suffers through Jesus eternally, everlastingly, without change. That is what actually um, Stump says in her atonement, she says that it's not something that happened at one moment of time. It's Jesus always eternally, everlastingly has his human nature. So if this is the case, and we believe we take a good, um, a, a, a good account, a strong account of the communication of idioms, that is the view that um, the predicates that apply to the human nature should apply to divine nature because Jesus is one person, is not two persons, what persons with two natures. And we can say God is born of the Virgin Mary, for example, that is, uh, uh, that is the 
communication of idioms, God dies on the cross, or God, uh, this human being, is the creator. So if we take really this view to heart, it seems to me that in a nuanced way, obviously, the challenge of hell comes back. Why? Because again, in his human nature, um, I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly the term that uh, um, Stump uses, but in his human nature, Jesus still is sharing the suffering of the damned in hell, in his human nature, that he has forever and ever. Obviously, again, this is more nuanced, because it's not saying in his divine nature. But that is, again, another, an, another issue, and that's the way in which the incarnation comes back and maybe brings back the challenge. Thank you, Ed. Great. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, David. For uh, any other question or okay. So thanks again, David. And uh, thank you. And uh, sorry for the technical problems, but uh, I think it it works at the end, right? I uh, know. Happens, happens. Once happened to me during a conference, like in person, in uh, the Wittgenstein Symposium there in Accra. They were fig they were trying to fix the thing while I was giving my talk, so no worries. You know, we can empathize. Okay. So, no Thank worries. you. Thank you. Happens during Vibus, so you know. So no problem at all. Thanks again. And uh okay.